Hello and welcome to CRB. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Matt Darden, local entrepreneur, rack space -er, uh, guy about town. You may notice this gigantic flaming rectangle staring at me. We're going to try taping CRBs from now on. I'm going to put them on YouTube. Uh, video, whatever. If you don't like it in your speaker, awesome. Just let me know. I won't record you, won't put it up. Just trying it out, trying to extend our reach. Cool. Anyone looking for a gig nowadays? Yes, sir. I'm Rob Kenyon. I do DevOps, stack, front end development, and uh, architecture coaching. I'm an independent consultant, and I'm looking for and consulting me stuff. I'll be at the bar afterwards. Rob's incredibly good. If you're looking, yes, sir. Uh, I'm Ray Chandler. If you guys remember last week, I was both recruiting for Pillar and announcing I was leaving Pillar. Um, I have since left Pillar. I am an independent consultant. I'm in, uh, doing Ruby, JavaScript, Python, and actually Brian Costello and I are partnering to start a consulting company here in Columbus. So if you need work, see early stage. Flexible stuff, not flexible stuff. Come talk to us. We'll looking for clients too, right? Huh? Looking for clients too, right? They're looking for clients. Awesome. Oh, yes, sir. It's Josh Harla. I'm an experienced Microsoft and Cisco admin who spent the past six months retraining myself on Ruby and Rails, looking for any kind of entry level work we How are you liking it so far? Love it. Yeah? Yeah. Fun to go. It's always being exchanged. Beautiful. Welcome aboard, my man. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Chuck Schreiber. I have um, software tests and production support for my background. I've been uh, doing some self learning on group. Awesome. Welcome. Yes, sir. <coughs> Hello, I'm Justin Joseph. I'm following up with this gentleman. I'm also looking for an entry level opportunity with Ruby on Rails. I've been doing automation and doing Ruby for the past seven years, and I'm absolutely sick of it. Uh, <laughs> seven years on testing? Yeah. So the okay. uh, past year or so, I've been using as much free time as I have to train, to self-train with Rails, and mm -hmm. just looking for a chance to make use of skills. Welcome. Welcome. That's awesome. Seven years on testing. Yeah. We're ready to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone looking for, looking to hire? Yeah. So, uh, those that don't know me, I'm Scott Walker. I work for a San Francisco-based startup called Lando. Uh, we have an office here in Columbus now, right down behind the Melbourne short north next to the Hubbard Garage, uh, doing some interesting stuff to disrupt the online mortgage space. We're looking for uh, probably three or four people, uh, engineers primarily. So, if you're a talented Rubyist, I uh, want to work with some excellent people. Uh, we're currently a team of six here in Columbus, or I guess seven now. There's six of us are former educators. Look me up after this, or email me scottlendinghome.com, or ask Darby if you can reach me. They won't hire me, so you there totally, you totally want to work there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyone else looking to fulfill a gig? <laughs> yes, sir. My name is Josh Huckabee. I work for a company called Sign and Education Services. We are a fully virtual team, but one of our management partners will sign with us here. He's based in Columbus. The company is based here. We have a fairly decent size Rails application deals with uh, regulatory compliance, student information systems. We're looking for Rails developers, DevOps, Python people, you know, hacks. So this is really good for the market. They're good people. I talk with them. I vetted them. I swear. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Jones. I work for Two Checkout. Uh, we are, as, as always, uh, looking for uh, Ruby developers. Even but better if you have a little bit of Perl experience. Uh, <laughs> we don't like Perl too much because we're trying to get rid of it. Uh, we did we did successfully release our first public-facing Ruby app last week. Really? Yay. Um, so yeah, I'll be at the bar afterwards. Come talk to me. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Mike McCann. I'm actually with a group called Red One Ventures, formerly Tech Columbus, and I'm here more so on behalf of our portfolio companies. So we have dozens of open positions across uh, many of those companies, several of which are in the uh, Ruby sphere. So if you're interested or, or think you might want to try out working for an early stage startup at the C, the, the startup stage, come find me and we'll try to find a place for you. Awesome. 
Wonderful. Yes, sir. I'm Alex Moore, and I work for Bashful Technologies. Uh, you probably might know us, we make React, which is a distributed database. Um, but we're always looking for great engineers. Um, if you want to do something a little, something else than Rails, do something a little more distributed systems, hit me up. Hi, um, I'm not Caleb Dumont. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, I work for JP Morgan Chase. Maybe I shouldn't work on that. Uh, <laughs> I'll edit that out. <laughs> but uh, we're looking for expand our team. Um, He'll still email you every day. <laughs> Uh, we've got a lot of a uh, lot of interesting people who work for us right now. So a lot of talented people. <laughs> interesting people. <laughs> we're talented people. Um, we got a pretty large Ruby team, about a dozen people, and we're still trying to expand. So uh, we're looking for um, all types, uh, even people who are you know heavy in UI and, and don't have any real backend experience. That's fine. Uh, people who have testing experience or something like that, uh, you know, switching careers. We've got a couple people on our team right now who. You know, started from different careers, like uh, you know, from totally different disciplines. So uh, we are willing to take chances on people who uh, who need our, you know, we're, we're highly motivated and are, are uh, very interested in working for us. So um, a bunch of people on our team are here. Come see us during the bar or at the bar and talk with us. So, uh, we'll have some stories. Gail <laughs> <laughs> and this guy. They all work. other people who have awesome. through our, our doors. Uh, <laughs> you can talk to them too. And, uh, uh, and you have Rachel. That's cool. <clears throat> Perfect. Anyone else looking to? Well, I'm sorry. Rachel, please. So, I mean, I, I think my first Ruby on Rails application was in 2006. Yeah. So, I've been a Ruby on Rails programmer for a long time, but most recently attempting DevOps things in Ruby. And the job uh, hunt in earnest. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Good yeah. for you, Rachel. Yeah. I just, uh, I've been working at Chase for like six years. And, you know, something <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with Chase. <laughs> well, it's not that bad. Just making your job, eh? Hard. Yeah. 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 We'll scrub that from the video. Yeah. Too. <laughs> Super excellent place to work. Beautiful. Well, do we have any new people? New here? Oh, I'm. Oh, geez. How could I forget suit code? Go ahead. Hey, I'm Kevin Finez. We are as always looking for um, experienced Ruby developers, some of less experienced Ruby developers. Uh, basically, takes all stripes. Um, I am at the bar. Actually, most of the time. <laughs> but, uh, unrelated to my work. Um, so, if you're interested, also at coverameds.com slash main slash careers, which is a full uh, an official listing. So, check us out. URLs. <laughs> cool. Is this anyone's first CRB? Just real quick, just show of hands. How did any of you guys hear about us? Just yell it out. It's word of mouth. I don't remember. You don't remember, sweet. Keep it going. Ah, man, dash. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, cool. So uh, right here, I put up register.columnistrb.com if you're unfamiliar. Basically, uh, JetBrains is going to be giving away a software license of your choice to whatever package that you like. As long as you sign up at register.columnistrb.com, even if you don't want a license, please sign up. So long as we have 30 people, someone gets a license. So even if you don't want one, sign up. Say you don't want one, perfect. Someone gets something. Cool. All right. Well, tonight we have uh, Mr. Rob Kenyon talking about DSL Maker and John Arnett, Elegant Collection Operations in Ruby. Who would like to go first? Is John Arnett here? Hey. Perfect. Awesome. I am closer. Do I mean, you want to go first? Why not? It's up to you. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Cool. Uh, we have an HDMI connection that generally works. Yeah, that should be fine.
John Arnett, thank you. <laughs> hey everybody, so my name is Jonathan Arnett. Uh, I go by Jern on the internet, that's J3RN. Uh, I work at Cover My Meds. And uh, Ruby Gems has been mean to me today, so I'm gonna have to do this the hard way. Cool, hello, yeah. I was supposed to be while I was talking, but you know, life's hard. Um, so hey, I have a talk today to give to you, and it's about uh, what I like to call e-commerce. And not this e-commerce, it's this e-commerce. Uh, this is a term I invented while I was driving here. Um, <laughs> it's a new buzzword, you should tweet it out. Um, it stands for Elegant Collection Operations with Map, Reduce, and Select. <laughs> um, and that's literally the end of my slides, because uh, I don't like slides. So, um, if anybody here is familiar with some more uh, functional type languages, I mean, Ruby has a lot of functional stuff, but like a more strict functional language, um, you map, reduce, and uh, filter probably sound familiar to you. Um, Ruby actually doesn't have a filter, it's called select, and it does the same. Anyway, uh, we're going to jump into not SpaceX. We're going to jump into some code. Is that legible to the people in the back? Yeah, good. All right, cool. <clears throat> um, so we don't need this anymore. Enter the real talk. Um, all right. <clears throat> so just from a show of hands, how many people here started programming in Java, C, or C++? Like at least half the room. Yeah, me too, actually. Uh, I was uh, taught Java in high school. They were like, it's hip and new. Um, yeah, right. Um, anyway, so I wrote this file called bad.c. Uh, and it's full of some great C code here. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, my C style is not what you're probably used to. If you code in C, don't yell at me, I'm sorry. Um, it's more Java style, but that's irrelevant. And also uh, seg faults if you run it. Fun fact. Anyway, so uh, what we got here is we got this big array of uh, a million elements. <clears throat> and then here we just iterate over them and uh, just assign, uh, this is just sort of an initialization thing. Just assign each one to i, so it's like they're assigned to zero through uh, 900,000. Yeah, you get the idea. <clears throat> anyway. And we have this section here that's a map, um, where you just map each element to itself times two. Uh, we have a reduce section where you start with this thing that is initialized to zero, and then you just add each element to it. And then uh, at the bottom we have um, the select section, which uh, we create a new array with half the elements of the first one, and then we only add the items that are even. Um, so. This is a uh, sort of functioning C code. I mean, not entirely, because it's still psych faults, but uh, this is sort of the way you would do these sort of things in C. So what I've noticed is that a lot of people who are trained on these languages like to take the way you do things in C, or Java, or C++, and transfer it to Ruby. So, bad.rb. For comparison, uh, I created this cute little class, it's called test class, uh, where we initialize a big array. Um, gosh, for i in stuff in Ruby is so clunky, never use it. Um, and I'll tell you why later, but like, it pains me to write that. Um, anyway, because it kind of looks like the C, but it's like a hack, whatever. Um, so we have, this map section where we start with an empty array and we just map everything to the element times two for each of them. Um, reduce, we start with this thing that's initialized as zero and then we just add each thing to it and return it. And we have uh, a select section where we start with an array and then we iterate over each element in the original array and if it's even, we add it to the new array and return that. 
So if you were to compare these two side by side, you'd notice that they're actually really quite similar, um, other than one's a class and one is just a giant main function. <clears throat> um, but I'm here to tell you that this is bad and you shouldn't do it. Um, and I will show you why. I'm going to create a new class or a new file called good.rb and I'm going to take all the contents out of here and put it in here. Uh, we're going to call this new class. And what we're going to do right now is refactor because refactoring is fun. <clears throat> all right, so remember how I said I hated for loops? Yeah, this whole thing's really dumb. Here, let's uh, delete that, get rid of that, delete all this crap, dot two A. <clears throat> um, so when you do a range like that, zero to a million, it just sort of lays out this collection that is zero to one million. And the fact that you would go over it and assign stuff just doesn't make sense. Um, all right, actually, yeah, well, whatever. <clears throat> okay, cool. So that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about map, reduce, and select. Um, so at the top here, we've got this empty array. We iterate over the original array, uh, multiply things by two, uh, stow them back in the thing, and then return that at the end. Uh, this is a really clunky way. <clears throat> There's actually a fun one-liner for this. Dot map. Sorry for live coding. It's really slow. <clears throat> Don't need any of that anymore. X times two. <clears throat> so this is the condensed Ruby syntax for iterating, iterating over everything taking each element and multiplying it by two. So these two methods do the same thing. Just one is uh, a lot longer. <clears throat> All right, so there's a semicolon in here. That's kind of funny. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, sure. Do you maybe need to assign that array.map to your new uh, that's a good question. So, yeah, right. So, um, the thing is, what the map method does on in my test class is it's just defined within the scope of that method, yep. and then uh, isn't used anywhere else. So it's um, so you're returning the result out of maps. So right. Yeah. So um, if I were to like do this, it would er start erroring because map array isn't defined. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, you'll actually notice that there's a very distinct pattern. There's another semicolon. Too much C. Um, there's a very distinct pattern. You initialize something, you do a bunch of stuff with it, and then you return it at the end. So like here, I initialized it, did a bunch of stuff with it, and returned it at the end. If you ever see this pattern in your code, that means it's ripe for using one of these three methods. <coughs> um, so. The map is for used for when you're wanting to do a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, so our original array is a million elements, and what we're returning is also going to be a million elements, but we're going to have done something with each of those. That's when you want to do map. For example, multiply by two. <coughs> um, reduce is different. Reduce is when you have a collection, and your end result is you just want one thing out of it. You want to add them all together, or you want to, I don't know, concatenate a whole bunch of strings, though there's probably a better way to do that. But uh, reduces for when you, your result is just one thing. So um, we have this thing, ACC is zero, and then we iterate over each item in the array, we add it to it, and then we return that at the end. <clears throat> this two can all be one line. Ray dot reduce <coughs> to 
So that does the same thing, but it gets better from here. Uh, as RoboComp will happily yell at you, you can actually do stuff like this where you're just uh, adding something or multiplying something or just calling a method on something over and over to get your result um, by just passing whatever the method is. Like so. <clears throat> Take my array of integers, reduce with the plus function, and the result is all of them added together. One line. <clears throat> all right, select is a fun one. Select is where you have an array and you want to only select certain items out of it. Um, in other languages, it's called filter pretty commonly um, because you're filtering the array. So we've got our uh, array and we're just choosing the even ones. So this too can be condensed to one line. Array dot select. And we can do a do here, that's fine. So I think that works, I'm not positive. But uh, the <coughs> better way, no, actually, I tell you what, it's, uh, it's uh, that. <coughs> so yeah, that uh, works. Basically, whoops, missing an X here. All right, so what this says is we're, for each X, if X modulo two is zero, um, that'll return a truthy value and that'll tell select that you want to keep this one. If it returns a falsy value, then I'll kick it out. Um, and then there's a million aliases to select. There's like keep if and like delete if, which does the same thing, but inverse. Like if it's false, it keeps it. If it's true, it leaves, whatever. Um, but actually, uh, since I like cute Ruby methods better than doing modulus and stuff, there's actually a dot even class, or a dot even method rather dot even, x dot even. I mean, take your choice, but I like that one better. <clears throat> Alright, so I actually have Also, let me know if I go over. I feel like I'm rambling. <clears throat> Bad spec. Instead of requiring bad, we're going to require good. Instead of test class, we're going to do new class. Just make sure all the specs still pass. <sighs> no bundler. Oh, man. OK. All right, that's cool, Ruby Jones, whatever you want to do. Um, just trust me, it works. Hey! <laughs> All right, so uh, just as a tail off here, I have a couple more advanced examples from things I found at work. So here we go. Spec, advanced, not advanced spec. Nope, why would I go in spec anyway? Uh, advanced example, merging hashes. So uh, you pass in a big bunch of hashes uh, that you all want to get merged together. So it starts off, you have an empty hash, you just go through and merge each one, and then you return at the end. Has that that smell to it, that code smell, where you're like, initialize, do stuff with it, return. All right, how can we do this better? <clears throat> Hash, we're merging stuff. Uh, at the end, we're just returning one thing. It's not, uh, it's not the same number of hashes. You want to want to return a whole another set of hashes. That'd be weird. Uh, you're not returning a subset of hashes. You're returning one thing. So it sounds like it's a reduce. So reduce takes uh, two items in the block that you have what's called your accumulator and your item. Uh, the accumulator is just what's returned at the end. So yeah. Um, so what we're doing here is our accumulator is just getting merged with each item. I think that's good. For each item, we have this accumulator. Oh, you know what? <coughs> Initial value is empty hash. 
<coughs> we have this accumulator, and for each of them, we're just merging them in one after the other. Merge or merge bang? It's, uh, it's interesting because the value or the return of the block is assigned to the next accumulator. Um, so if merge bang returns the same thing, it'll still work, but it's unnecessary. Merge bang returns nothing. Then merge is the only one that'll work. <coughs> Error, you don't have permissions. All right, you know what? That's fine. Just trust me. All right. <laughs> There's a lot, this is a big trusting relationship. All right, so uh, this next one came out of a gem that I wrote uh, for work. It's, uh, we've got this hash, and we're given an array of keys that are sort of act like a path to this value that we want to get to at the end. Um, so, uh, let's see, we've got this, we duplicate the hash because we don't want to modify it. And then for each key, uh, we assign that new hash to whatever the value of that hash with that key is. So if the first key is deeply, um, new hash will be assigned to the hash containing nested and then value within that. And then so on and so forth. Uh, until you get to the end. And I made a lot of assumptions like this, like uh, the keys are actually in the hash. Or like you don't overflow the hash because things will happen and be bad. Um, all right, so let's look at those. <clears throat> the end result is we want to get the value at the end of the rainbow here. So uh, we're just returning one thing. Sounds like a reduce. <clears throat> so hash dot reduce. No, actually, I like keys dot reduce. All right, let's see. I don't think we need an initial value. And it takes an accumulator and your item. <clears throat> and uh, what we did down here is we updated new hash to be the value of new hash with our key, whatever key we passed in. <clears throat> so I think that'll work the same here. Except we do have to initialize to you're right, hash to hash, keys. so you're right. <coughs> All right, starts as the hash, and then for our first item, we get whatever that is, and then uh, that becomes the accumulator, and then we'll fetch the next key out of that. That'll become the accumulator, we'll fetch the next key out of that until we have gone down the entire array of keys to the end. Um, and I have an awesome spec for that, that, you know, Ruby gems. Um, so, all right, this last one was fun. I think I wrote this recently, and it was a whole big pain. It was like an hour of like, how do I code golf this into a single line? Um, so we've got this hash, and what we want is we wanna know how many of the keys passed in in this array are really in the hash in that order. So like if we got the array deeply nested value, that's good, we just send that back. We'd be like, all right, cool. Um, if we got like deeply keys, it would say, all right, deeply is there, but keys is not nested under that, so like throw that away. We don't need that. Uh, or if we got like just an array like ABC, it would just return empty array, like none of these are real, forget about it. Um, so the way I did it is I start with an empty array for my real keys, uh, duplicate this hash so we don't modify the original one, and then for each key, uh, we find whatever uh, that key is inside the hash, which uh, could be nil if it's not in the hash. Um, and if it's nil, that's a falsy value. And then do end. And then pretty much this, but not quite. If instead of temp hash, we're just doing. Uh, ACC one, or no, rather ACC zero, and then this will be. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> ACC zero, the key, and then we will get. Whoops. And 
can get rid of all this stuff. <coughs> Voila. It's not clean, but it works. Except so, you don't want to pass, you want to pass back. Oh, so you're right. Okay. All right. So uh, the value of keys dot reduce will be um, an array containing two elements. So we can say like finished hash or underscore because we don't care about it. And then like we'll just call it path because it's kind of like a path. And that'll be our array. And then we will return path at the end. Um, so we start with a hash in an empty array. Uh, the accumulator in this case is our array of our hash and our empty array. And then if you can fetch this key out of the hash, which is the first element of the accumulator, uh, then we're going to recurse again, where we have entered the next level of the hash, and then we have appended this key to the our array of keys that we know exist. And uh, if Ruby was working, I would totally show you that it works, but not today. <laughs> yes, sir. Deeply comma value will return deeply value and not just deeply. Deeply comma value. You're right. That's true. Um, actually, in the implementation for the app, we had a case where it was um, actually I think it was else nil no, or something like that. It was no. Um, please. There. Um, or maybe it was correction. Something like that. Where it's we want to maintain our list of uh, our list of keys that we've already gotten, but we don't want to try and descend any deeper because then we'll be like, yeah, deeply and then value, but they're not actually connected. They're sort of like dispersed. Um, so yeah, good catch. Yes, sir. Um, so I noticed on uh, your first example on reduce, when it's just real simple array of numbers, all you did was pass in the simple plus. I'm curious, in your first example here, it seems like you get a very simple case where you initialize to more than <coughs> and then cram two things together with one method. What is it that stops you from just saying reduce and then the symbol merge? You know what? I'm going to try because I have no idea. <sighs> mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine. Uh, I guess other way, how, how smart is Ruby at, at assuming those default accumulator values? I haven't toyed with it too much. If I'm ever unsure, I'd just be verbose about it. Um, like here. <coughs> Well, uh, you know what? Can you just load a file in Ruby? Is that cool? Load good Ruby. Or in IRB. <clears throat> All right, we've got our advanced examples. New. Yeah. Just call this A. I'll take you up on this later. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, question about map. When you were showing that example, I was looking at that and thinking, that looks an awful lot like how I'm already using collect. Can you tell me what's the difference between map and collect? I actually think they're aliases to each other. Let me, let me double check that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that they're aliases. All right. If you pass in <clears throat> colon merge at the second parameter, your first one it'll work. It does it? Okay, cool. Thanks. But it still needs an initializer. I'm gonna Yes, because it kind of assumes what you want to accumulate it to. Is it like that? Alright, it does. So it is smart enough. Okay. Yay. Cool. Cool. Today I like. Anybody any other questions? My cables. It is actually really easy to write your own DSL. <laughs> so, who am I? Rob Kenyon, been a DevOps lead for many years. DSL creation is really, really useful when dealing with DevOps and operations in general. And we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. But that's how I got into the idea of wanting to make DSLs and wanting to create DSLs that are very specific both to what I'm doing and also, more importantly, where I'm at. 
every single organization has its own vocabulary for talking about things. And generic tools like Puppet and Chef, which are DSLs by the way, don't speak in those vocabularies because, well, they're generic tools. And it's really handy to have specific tools that speak in your vocabulary so that you can take these DSLs and talk to various people who aren't technical about the problems at hand. So they're domain-specific languages. They're languages, which means they're meant for communication. They're meant to communicate to between people. Um, they're restricted to specific concepts that form a domain. So we're not going to have a language that is specific to snow and palm trees, because you really don't have too many domains that cross that cover both of those. And really, you want to have it limited. I'm serious, you really do. Because a language that is not limited to something is a generic language, which doesn't really help in improving the communication. So when we talk about communication, we want to talk about communicating between things. So generally, you have an author, like a developer, who communicates to an executor, like a computer. We call this program. But we also want to be able to communicate to ourselves in the future, or if any of you people are ever um, unfortunate enough to have to maintain my code. <laughs> um, you want to be able to communicate through time into the future. But we also want to be able to communicate between the guy who's telling you what to do and the guy who's actually doing it. Or to the guy who did it and the guy who's got to figure out whether or not it was done. And so on and so forth. So communication is really in a lot of different directions. Here's the thing. That's the only computer. That's the only one who actually doesn't care how well you communicated it. Because computers, by definition, are things that are willing to do whatever you tell it, however many times you tell it, without even thinking about what they're doing. They don't care. Everyone else here in this list is a human. And humans do care. Humans hate being forced to parse out all this crap. Humans don't want to do things over and over. They don't want to do things without having to think about it. They want you to squeeze it all down into as little as possible so that they can get on with the rest of their day, which is probably playing Bejeweled Blitz or something like that. And more importantly, communication is two-way. Between author to executor, computer's not going to tell you anything. Computer's not going to sit down and go, you know what, I had a really great weekend you know, this weekend. I had a great day. You know, we, we went to this great place. To eat. No, they're not going to tell you that. Every other one of those, they are. And so when you're communicating about a concept under discussion, like how do I package something, or how do I style a web page, or how do I get data from the database, there's a back and forth. And when we want to talk about how we specify these things, how we communicate about them, these communication vehicles need to be two-way. So let's talk about different domain-specific. So, by the way, my style, um, if you have any questions, just type up. Um, you're not being rude. You're being very polite by telling me I'm going too fast or too slow, or can you explain that? Because if you ask the question, three other people probably aren't going to ask it. All right, so any questions so far? In human languages, we have domain-specific languages. Eskimos, for example, everyone's heard that they have like 50 or 70 words for snow, and you probably have also been told that's not true. Well, it kind of is. Most Inuit languages like German tend to create these huge compound words. Um, I heard one yesterday, explosive bufa maka or something like that. Somebody who makes explosives. And it was like a 19 syllable word in German. There is a more specific language though. Sami, the, these are, this is a tribe of reindeer herders that live on the border of Finland and Russia. And yes, the two actually have a border, that's a land border. It's way up in the Arctic Circle. Um, I think you get snow for 390 days a year. <laughs> and they have a thousand words, unique words, English style words, not like German or Inuit where they like take 19 words and squish them into one, for dealing with reindeer. For example, a snari is a reindeer with short branched horns. That's not the coolest one though. That one is. 
<laughs> and so, because it's such a cool word, I'm going to take it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going I'm to use it to, I'm coining a word, use this in Twitter. Bustat is the quality of having appropriately specific expressiveness for the domain. It is appropriately expressively terse. I mean, seriously, if you were a reindeer herder and you said, hey son, go get the Bustat, I'm pretty sure that's a unique identifier for however many reindeer you have. <coughs> And the cool thing is, you could also go tell them to get the Snari Busat. You know, I mean, that's even more uniquely identifying. <laughs> so, DSLs you already use. That's a DSL. Can anyone tell me what its domain is? Relational database access. Close. It's a set manipulation DSL. You can use SQL to manipulate any kind of set, or any set of sets, really. We just happen to use it for data storage and accessing data storage. Anyone know what this one is? Style manipulation. No. Hell. <laughs> it's a tree visitor definition language. That was my second guess. Of course it was. <laughs> So actually, this is really important. CSS. People think the most important thing about CSS is all the different uh, properties you set, right? Because that's what we care about when we're using CSS. And nobody really thinks about that little tiny thing that goes to the left of that first brace. CSS has six different ways of specifying what set of nodes this stuff in the braces should apply to. In addition, CSS has only one thing you can do to a node. Set its properties. So really, the domain it's talking about is how do I tree walk something? And then set metadata on it. It's actually really, really cool DSL for that. Maybe a little less well-known, Hamel. It's a DSL for defining HTML. Nothing special there. And then finally, the last one that pretty much everyone knows. <coughs> this is a DSL. It's a really crappy DSL. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a DSL because it has very specific shortcuts for issuing commands on the command line and then storing them all up and then uh, reasoning over them. Reasoning very poorly, which is why it's crappy, but it does do some pretty cool stuff. So where would you want to use a DSL? There's a lot of places. Basically, every time you're talking about one thing, and you need to be able to communicate about that thing between a specifier and an author, or more importantly, between an author and a maintainer, or even more importantly, between an author and a verifier, developer, project manager, QA, so on and so forth. And what we want to do is we want to take things that we normally don't check into source control, and we want to put them into source control. Because when things are in source control, we can manage them better. We can take the processes that we already use that we've really worked on very well for developing software and start applying them to all these other little squishy bits that we've never really applied those formalized processes about. Um, bug tracking, change management, pull requests, tests. Tests are good, right? DSLs also let the important things shine. And we'll see some examples of that in a minute. Um, because general purpose is overly verbose. The DSL parser that I use is Ruby. So you can do all the Ruby things. It's, they're very chef-like in that, in that way. But we want to be able to say, this is the only thing we actually care about. Here's five lines, and it describes something really complicated. SQL, for example. If anyone's ever tried writing out in Ruby what a, what a four or five line select statement does, who here has ever done that? Having to do all the filtering and the, and the projection and the joining and all of that. Um, if you've never done that, I'd, I'd actually do that as a kata. I'm serious. 
actually go and try and create a set of arrays and then join them together and do where clauses on them and then do selects against them potentially with groups and ordering. It's a lot harder than you would think. It's a really expressive DSL. This is one everyone knows who's ever had to deal with Java or C++. This is where all the bugs hide when you have 19 sections of code that are almost identical. Or are they, should they be identical? Was there a reason why this one has something slightly different in the 100 lines? I don't know. Comments are never right. Remember I said that QA wants to deal with, your DS, with the concepts behind your DSLs. So do project management. So do no, anyone else. And it'd be really cool if the people who actually know what they want can tell you what they want in executable form. So, DSL is to Ruby as Ruby is to Java. Just keep that in mind. So, when we write a DSL, we're writing a programming language here. Make no mistake, we are writing a programming language. But it doesn't have to be as hard as writing a Ruby or a Java. We need to be able to parse it. We probably want to validate it in some way. Throw syntax errors, throw, you know, you can't call that method on an array. And then we want to produce something. Ruby produces execution. SQL produces uh, a, a, a set that was the value of your select statement. Um, CSS produces pretty stuff. So there is a module, DSL Maker. It's out on Ruby Gems. Um, some guy wrote it. I wonder who. And you can use this for parsing. So here's an example of, can everyone read this? Of a actual class, Ruby on the left, this is the DSL on the right. So we can see that we're defining cars. And you can see that it's relatively compact. So we're gonna create some structures to hold the result. This is the actual inheritance. We wanna add an entry point. An entry point is the top level. And the top level says, we're gonna return stuff. When we're done with parsing the DSL, this is what ends up. This is the various attributes of this level of the DSL. So we have a make, needs to be coerced as a string. So we're gonna have two S applied to it. Integer, two I applied to it. And then the engine is going to be another level of DSL. And that you can nest as often and deeply as you want. When you're done parsing this thing, do these things. So we want to default the make of the car to the first value in the arcs. So civic here becomes the make where a chord was in the first one. <coughs> and then at the end, we want to produce a car with the make, the model, and the engine. We can also go down one level. So you see how in the first one, the engine has a Hemi. And it's, the Hemi is a Boolean. Booleans are yes or no, on or off, true or false. And when we're done parsing that engine bit, return our engine struct, which gets put into the engine value here, which is this guy right here. So when we're done, we parse it with the script on the left. Oh look, we parse DSL, vehicles, and we end up with an array of two cars. One of them with the engine set, the thing we went down deeper. And yes, it becomes an array of two things that's handled automatically for you. Again, just pipe up with any questions. Let's say we wanted to add a second entry point because we now want to parse trucks. That's all we gotta do. Same script, and we end up with a truck in the middle there. 
Parsing is only one problem, though. We also want to be able to validate. So let's add a validation on car. We say that cars have to have engines because most cars aren't very helpful without having an engine. So presumably, the second one should throw an error. Because unless it has an engine, we return this value. And when add validation gets something returned, it will throw that as the, as the error. And boom, it raises the error. Cars must have an engine. Production, though, you're on your own for that. Basic tree walking, if you build it as a set of structs. Generally, you want to work from the outside in. Parsing is done from inside out. Production should be done from outside in. You want to transform as a series of passes. You know, do one thing at a time. And then don't do anything irrevo irrevocable until you've actually gone through everything and made sure that you've constructed everything in a set of temp directories or stationary. It's ready. Patches are welcome. I'm blogging about this two to three blog posts a week. Um, right now I'm talking about how to use DSL Maker in a DSL that I'm calling Packager to define how you construct packages. And this sli these slides will be on SlideShare. I'll shoot the link to Darby um, so you can shoot it around to everybody. Any questions? Uh, so I was curious, um, the the syntax for actually defining these is kind of, I don't know, looks kind of like JavaScript, to be totally honest. Uh, have you considered making a DSL to help write that? <laughs> that <laughs> is on the to-do list of the DSL maker. Um, actually, it sounds kind of inceptionish, DSL but if you think about it, um, it is a very specific domain how to construct a DSL. And so it can make a lot of sense to have a DSL for the purposes of constructing DSLs. Um, and that is on the to-do list to get done, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't do it like that. And actually, if you look at, if you look at that, um, it's very similar to how we write code. Um, list developers talk a lot about building the language to meet problem space. And if you talk to really, really experienced Lisp, Lisp and Haskell developers, Lisp more than so, they'll say that they essentially create a business specific DSL to solve the problem space with as few invocations as possible at the top level. They bring Lisp into the business jargon of the client at hand. You know, not to be a uh, not to be a stickler or anything, but make would not be a cord. It would be a Honda model would be a cord. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, that that makes perfect sense. In 1990, a cord come with him. <laughs> I was going over my slides today, and I'm like, hmm, maybe I should put the heavy on the on the F-150, but I I don't tr I don't vehicle I don't car, so it's a pretty badass 25 year old car. Man. <laughs> maybe maybe it was an aftermarket edition. So Bash and SQL are DSLs with Ruby and like Perl arms. They're not specific to a domain. That's the difference. Ruby, Perl, English, Swedish, uh, Java, uh, Brainfuck for that matter. Um, these are all generic languages. The idea is that they are suited to solve all problems equally okay-ish. Uh, they're sixes, or Brainfuck, negative sixes, um, to solve all problems. Um, uh, Perl, for example, is slightly better suited to text manipulation than, say, a C. C is slightly better for systems development or places where memory and resources are, are very tight. Uh, so you could consider it that they're generic languages with a predilection towards one thing or another. Domain-specific languages are different. SQL, CSS, Hamel, they're not Turing complete. You cannot solve all problems with them. You can only solve this problem with them. And because they completely throw away the ability to solve every other kind of problem, 
they are extremely expressively terse within the domain that they are charged to solve, that they're designed to solve. They have busat there. <laughs> um, whereas Ruby can solve any, one, any problem, but it only solves those problems at an eight or a seven. So the fact that bash is for running Unix commands makes it a DSL versus a program language. Exactly. Has anyone ever tried to write anything else but a shell script in bash? I know people who've written web applications in bash. You, I'm serious. I know people who've written web applications in C++ too. No. There are githubs for this, okay? I, I, I know some people who wrote a whole deployment in Bash, but it was a bad idea. It was a bad idea, and that actually is a really good example. A client that both Matt and I have worked at that will remain nameless, twice, um, <laughs> has, I think it was 40,000 lines of Bash for a deployment system. Isn't that like Bash itself is like 40,000 lines? <laughs> <laughs> the killer is that it worked for some very large values of worked. <laughs> so you can do it. It's just not suited for that. It would be like trying to write a deployment system in, in uh, ProcMail RC, which is Turing complete, by the way. You could do it. You shouldn't. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for going to the last one. Yay, Rob. Thank you, man. Just in the interest of time, real quick, uh, I selected a winner for the license giveaway already. Uh, so no drum roll. I do have a drum set and a camera, so I think I need to bring the drum set in for a drum roll as well. Um, thank you, exactly. Kenny Drobnik, there he is, you want it. Good job. Yay, Kenny. Great. Yeah. So uh, if you're new, we all meet at the Rusty Bucket. It's literally walking distance through the parking lot. Uh, you don't have to drink, but damn, come out and hang out and network, because this is the real point of CRV. Sweet? All right. Thank you all for coming, man. We'll see you next month. Yay.